Good uh, evening. How are we doing, guys? I know this is not optimal. We would much rather be meeting in person. Um, but because of this, I'm able to actually invite you guys once again to my home. It's a little different this time. Usually, I have my girls here with me. Um, I'm now a freshman leader uh, here at HSM. But um, we're going to make do with what we got because God still has something to do here. It's not about just a service. It's about what we do with our lives. And so it's pretty cool we get to meet this way. Um, again, my name's Sam. And uh, in case you don't know me or you haven't met me yet, um, and I actually get to serve alongside all your leaders here. Uh, and I'm with the ninth grade girls. And so today um, I get the chance uh, to be able to kind of deep dive a little bit more as we go further into our sermon series where we are talking about the Beatitudes. And uh, we are actually, uh, we just uh, listened already uh, from all the other leaders about um, what exactly that Sermon on the Mount was, um, how he said, blessed are those who are weak, blessed are those who hunger, blessed are those that mourn, uh, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, and we went through all of it and last week, uh, Tyler did a great job where he went into what does it mean to be the salt and light of the earth uh, and what was Jesus talking about there. And so we're going to go ahead and dive right back in. Uh, we're at Matthew 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 17 in the New Testament. Um, get your Bibles ready or your app or whatever it is you have. Um, and let's go ahead and just deep dive into it. Uh, There's some pretty thick stuff here. And so we're going to kind of do an overview of what it is. Um, but know that in your small groups, if you have any questions or if you want to talk about something else or, or something that this kind of triggered, that your leaders are there for you. So don't just drop off. Make sure that you join small groups afterwards. And so Matthew 5, uh, verse 17, read along with me. It says, don't misunderstand why I have come. And this is Jesus speaking. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. See, Jesus had just given the Beatitudes and it was this life changing, the greatest sermon ever, ever preached. Um, and it was adding on to the Ten Commandments. And so he knew right away that people were going to be confused. He knew that people were going to say, wait, does this mean that we no longer have to follow the Ten Commandments? Instead, we need to follow these uh, different ways of being blessed. And so Jesus kind of stopped that, that discussion right then, right off the bat. Um, again, he's such a great orator and he already knew what they were thinking. And so he tried to address that. And he tells the people here that the Old Testament, that that Old Covenant has not been removed. That that time that Moses went up on the mountain and uh, gave the, the Ten Commandments, um, that that is not changed. But what has changed is that Jesus came and he fulfilled not only the prophecy, but he was actually completing the law. So those Ten Commandments that were more worried about, hey, you're going to be punished if you don't do this and don't do this, and was discussing the different actions that you should show if you're one of God's chosen people. Instead, he added on to it. And so for my gamers out there, he's not just saying the law is abolished. He's actually saying, no, we're leveling up. We're actually adding to it. And so uh, God here isn't just, uh, and as we saw with the entire uh, Beatitudes, God wasn't addressing the actions of his people. Instead, he was saying, your heart matters. Your spirit matters. If you want to follow me, then you will have a meek spirit. You will mourn with those that mourn. If you follow me, your heart, your spirit will change. It's not just based on your physical actions, but it's based also on your spirit. See, the body and the spirit are unified into one. And so he wanted to make sure that it was, it was not just the actions that were being addressed as in the Ten Commandments, but rather it was the entire being and that your life would be transformed. And they, again, they didn't know. They didn't quite understand what Jesus was saying here. They knew that they wanted to be blessed. They knew that uh, the way that this word is used here in the Beatitudes, uh, it's not just God's going to show you favor, but it's God is going to turn towards you. They knew they wanted more of God in their lives, but what did that look like? And so Jesus leveled it up and he tells them, hey, these Ten Commandments, you still have to follow them. But if you follow these things that happen within your spirit and you change your, your mind, your attitudes, 
then it will reflect more of God. It is more than just the Ten Commandments. It's the completion of the law. And so Jesus goes on to say here, uh, verse 18, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. See, the early followers still didn't completely understand the truth behind these verses. Jesus was still walking the earth. Some of them were still going, you know, is he just a prophet or has he been sent by God? Like, who is this guy? Is he just a really good rabbi and a really good teacher? Like, there was confusion. There was questioning. It wasn't until later on in his ministry that those answers actually started becoming more fully answered. He waited until just about the end when his people were ready to hear the truth before he finally said, yeah, I am who you say I am. I'm the Messiah. And so right now at this point, people think, well, he... It sounds good. And he says, no, I don't want it to just sound good. I want every detail of your life to be changed. And just as every detail of your life should be changed the moment that you become a believer, then every detail of the law needs to be followed. But we all fall short. See, God's people up until that point had tried over and over again to follow the the Ten Commandments. And it was this kind of sin cycle that happens that sometimes we even find ourselves in nowadays, especially if we haven't, haven't left something down at the feet of Jesus. But they would, they would go ahead and live their lives and then something would happen and sin would crop up into their lives and they'd cry out to God because they were being punished and, and, and God would hear their cries and he would send somebody down there like a judge or somebody to go ahead and save his people, whether it be from slavery or the temple being burned down or, or whatever it is that they were dealing with at that time. And then they would praise God and they would make a sacrificial offering with an animal and, and do this whole like sort of service thing that they would do and then they would leave the, the temple feel great about themselves, go back home, and then the cycle started over again because they were addressing only the issues of their behaviors. They weren't addressing the, the way that their minds should be changed. Their spirits should be changed through this. And this cycle kept happening over and over and over again. And what Jesus is alluding to here is that its purpose isn't just about your actions, it's about your entire self. See, God's law has always been created not only to address the behaviors of what his people should look like, but the behaviors that that, that it should look like should also glorify God. That is our purpose. We should glorify God in everything we do in order to be in relationship with him. We need to make sure that our hearts and our spirits are transformed and don't hold anything or harbor anything that might block us from being able to receive that gift. He's saying God doesn't just want the law to be upheld, but he wants every little piece of it also upheld. That means not just the verbiage that's addressing the behavior, but he wants the very spirit of the law to be upheld. So what does that mean? It means he's not just talking about make sure you don't murder, make sure you don't kill, but he's saying, hey, I don't want you to hate somebody. I don't want you to harbor resentment towards someone. I don't want your heart to be in an awful place. I don't want you to have envy or greed. I don't want you to have any of those thoughts inside of you. And thank God Jesus came because it's by Jesus's blood that we are able to conquer that sin that's hidden in our lives. We're able to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and to reveal those areas in our life that are actually holding us back. Man, I've been doing this for a while, this whole Christian thing. I wasn't raised in the church. And can I tell you, the moment I think I've got something conquered, God shows me there's something else that I'm harboring. This is a process. You don't just become saved and that's it. You actually become saved by grace and through his mercy, we're able to receive that forgiveness. But then God continually makes us upright, continually creates that new spirit inside of us. He he sent the Holy Spirit to go ahead and show us the way, to show us the areas that we're falling short, to prompt us to go towards God and to show us which way that is. 
Again, being saved is not a one-stop shop. It's a process. It's a process of sanctification. It's your daily life. It's your decisions. It's your moment-by-moment -moment thoughts. God's not just interested in what you show on Sunday or on Tuesdays when you go to youth group. God wants all of you. He wants what it is you're thinking about the moment your parents tell you to do something you don't want. <laughs> he, wants, he wants your thoughts to be so clean that when something is wrong in this world or one of your friends steps out in a way that is not reflective of God's will, that you would have the urge, you would have that tension inside of you to where you knew you'd have to stand up for those. That you would have to stand up for those that are mourning, those that don't have a voice, those that, that are hurting right now. Guys, we live in a fallen world, but God is slowly but surely revealing more and more of himself to us so that one day when Jesus does come back again, we're able to actually live a life full of praise for, for God, unhindered by our sin. Guys, maybe me talking about that whole sin cycle brought something up into you. Is there something you're struggling with right now? Is there something that you continually are asking prayer for? Or maybe you're just new to this whole Christian thing and you don't even know where you stand or if you believe in God right now. I want you to know that, that we're here for you, that we wanna hear about those things. As Jesus got up on a mountain and gave this message, he has given each and every one of your leaders here a burden to help walk with you. You're not alone. And we wanna help you guys. We want you to understand that sin does not have you wrapped up in its, its bondage, that you can live a life free of that because Jesus came and he completed the law. He doesn't just want you to act like a Christian. He wants you to actually be a Christian, both inside and out. He goes here in verse 19. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Guys, that's a real fear. Is there something you are doing right now if you are calling yourself a Christ follower? Is there some thing or some attitude you have that is reflective upon your relationship with others that they are able to go, hmm, I don't know about that whole God thing, not if that's who they are. Have you led one of your brothers and sisters to harbor hateful thoughts or impure thoughts because of something that you shared? Are you leading those around you more towards Christ or are you making them walk away and shake their heads and say, man, those hypocrites. Are you living a life of integrity where you're not just speaking to speak, but you're actually walking it? It says anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Guys, that's our calling. That's our innermost desire is to be great with God in the kingdom of heaven. But in order to do that, you have to lay down your selfishness. You have to lay down the, the rights that you think you have to hold on to resentment or anger or hurts. Create in you a clean mind, God, and renew our spirit. Have it reflect more and more of you, God. That is our prayer. That's what the Bible says. It's all about that. The Bible alludes the entire time in the Old Testament that something good is going to happen. That these laws and this, this covenant that has been sent is just the tip of the iceberg. And then Jesus came to this ragtag group of people and says, we're leveling it up. The law has been completed. And then it says at the very end here, but I warn you, Verse 20, I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious laws and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And guys, when I read that, the first word that jumps up obviously is righteousness. Righteousness is a big word and I know we've already talked about it, but guys, to be righteous means to reflect more of God's will in your life. See, God is righteousness. Everything he does and says is right. 
And it's not dependent on the popular thought or shifting morals or what the culture says is okay. God is righteousness. And so what he's saying here, that unless you reflect more of God's will in your life, more than the people that are standing up there saying, this is what God's will is and maybe judging you and, 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 and saying, yeah, my way is the right way. The Pharisees, we all know a few people that are like that. Unless you are, are asking God to reveal more of what he wants for you, unless you're asking those questions where you're saying, God, I really have a decision to make here. I need you to show me which way is your will. Unless you're able to sit there and ask yourself time and time again, is what I am doing, what I am thinking, reflective of God's perfect character, of God's perfect will and righteousness in our life. Unless you're able to say that not only are you reflective of God's righteousness, but you are living in a way that is just. And you are fighting for those right now that maybe don't have that gift. Maybe you're fighting for those that don't have a voice. If you are not reflective of God's justice by being an instrument of it and helping support those right now that are hurting, then what are you doing? You are missing the point here. God is not interested in just your Sundays and Tuesdays. He wants your whole life. He wants your whole spirit to change. And thank God for Jesus and this servant on the mount. So guys, we're going to go back into small group. So don't drop off. And I know it was real heavy. But guys, if you have any questions, know that we as your leaders are here for you. That we are fighting for you. That we want to ensure that we are helping you be more observant of the Holy Spirit's calling in your life than what the world is telling you that you should do or should think. So we love you guys and enjoy your small group.